The life of a character should be an unbroken line of events and emotions, but a play only gives us a few moments on that line. We must create the rest to portray a convincing life. The direct effect on our mind is achieved by the words, the text, the thought, which arouse consideration. Our will is directly affected by the super objective, by other objectives, by a through line of action. Our feelings are directly worked upon by tempo rhythm. Konstantin Stanislavski. I've got you under my skin. Yeah. The late 90s was a transitional period for video games. On one hand, technology was bounding forward, and on the other, the market for games was the oldest it had ever been. From that cultural soup, Doom was born in a history that I won't belabor you with again. Fast, heavy violence was the thing. What Doom did, it did first, and better than anyone else. In its worldwide rampage, however, it was missing one thing. Story. John Carmack famously said to Tom Hall, Story in a game is like story in a porn movie. It's expected to be there, but it's not important. It follows, then, that the Doom guy has no real character. He's a silent extension of the player, a liaison to communicate to them through gameplay. In the time between Doom and Quake, there was a new face. Duke Nukem 3D. It was made in Ken Silverman's build engine, boasting lots of features that Doom lacked, but one of the most crucial to its identity was voice. Damn, those aliens bastards are gonna pay for shooting up my ride. Duke Nukem isn't terribly deep. He kills aliens and saves women. He's a joke, a send-up to 80s action with all the traits styled up to 11. In the same vein, Shadow Warriors, Lo Wang, is an homage to kung fu movies. Now at worst, these characters are... harmlessly offensive. Go, speed race, uh, go! Uh, <laughs> at best, they're one-note gags, good for some simple, low-brow jokes. There is one build game between them, though, revered for its refinement of the genre, and burned into the minds of its players for a reason its character. In addition to its tight level design and stellar gunplay, Blood ditched the straight-ahead rock soundtrack of its contemporaries for a more atmospheric soundscape. Droning chants, reverberating synths, and spacey percussion wrap you up in this dark, twisted world. aesthetics creep into every corner, corrupting even the most innocent places. And at the center of this madness is Caleb. Caleb is unlike any of his colleagues in the FPS genre. From the beginning, it's made clear that there is not a single glimmer of goodness in him. A gunslinger who rose to the top ranks of a cult, he, his girlfriend, and their friends are betrayed by their dark god, Chernabog. In his rage, he rises from the grave 
and announces his return. I live again. Caleb is a flat character. From the beginning of the story to the end, he is essentially the same person, maybe a little angrier than when he started. What makes him so memorable is that the character presented to the player is a real person brought to life by the undefeated Stefan Waite. He delivers every line in this coarse, gravelly voice that oozes chill. Bloodshed is his way of life, and nothing surprises him. He doesn't seem to have a shred of empathy or love left, only ever showing disdain for his enemies. Pathetic insects. Caleb keeps this cool, collected, even playful demeanor, but there's a menace crackling under the surface. No one wants to play with me. Every now and again, that dark personality breaks through in full force. One of the most integral weapons to blood is the TNT, which is also used to show off the dynamic props and physics of the build engine. Well, whenever you lob a bundle of dynamite into a group of enemies, flinging the bodies of cultists away in fountains of blood, engulfing the room in a storm of splinters and glass, in the eye of that storm, Caleb will sometimes just... let loose. <laughs> Chaos is intoxicating. There is nothing redeeming about him, and the player is put in an interesting position where both sides are villainous. Caleb is just as much a blight on the world as Chernabog. It's two evil forces clashing against each other, and it lends this very unique tone to the whole game. In other games, you rip through a room of enemies and just move on to the next challenge. In Blood, there's a real sense of aftermath. Broken windows, dead bodies, red pools flooding the ground, and just... silence. You stand there, as Caleb, in the middle of the destruction you've just caused, beaten and scraped, and you know for a fact that the only thing on his mind isn't triumph or relief. It's hate. Who wants him, huh? Who's next? There's a surprising dearth of information on weight, besides his attendance at Boston University and the London Academy of Music and Dramatic Art. In the mid-90s, he started working as a voice actor in games, kicking off with a few titles from Sierra and Humongous. These are more light-hearted, silly roles. He excels at accents and funny voices. No, I don't think so. I had this friend and he told me this story about his dentist brother who, um, he was made of wood and he got in the water and he sank. Really? Straight to the bottom. It's so scary. I wish I'd been a car. You might look at his performance as Caleb and find this dramatic shift in tone ironic, but I think that it's what gives the role its depth. See, while Duke and Lo Wang are inherently humorous characters, Caleb is a madman who still manages to find humor in the world. I've neglected to mention one of his most memorable character traits, his love of show tunes. Sailing, sailing in an email response to a fan inquiry, Waite said, It was my idea, moi, however, to sing and come up with the apropos songs. That's what made Caleb the different, sardonic, and lovable character that he is. The computer nerds and designers who do the games ain't theater or film script writers. If allowed, it's the actors who flesh out what is typically a stereotypical and boring, to me, character. He also confirmed that it was his decision entirely to use the Clint Eastwood-inspired voice. Nick Newhard, a lead designer on Blood, said that this comedic twist came from the environment at the office. The dark humor even infected Stefan, as we didn't discover Caleb's love of show tunes until he started warming up during our recording session. I think this point, about discovering this affinity, deserves a mention. 
Caleb may be single-minded, but he isn't one-dimensional. He isn't a farce. Wow, this promises to be fun. That, that, that's all, folks. Mm, this is better than cruel aid. Here's Johnny. It's a long way to Tipperary. It's a long way. How much is that doggy in the window? Orf, orf. Along came a spider and sat down beside her and said, What's in the bowl, bitch? There is a comedic element to his singing, but it's funny in a way that you'd find in a friend. It's endearing. It reveals that he's a person with likes and dislikes, who listens to music and enjoys it honestly. What I said earlier about how Caleb has no good in him was a bit of a lie. Now if you recall, one of the four chosen Chernabog betrays at the beginning is Caleb's girlfriend, Ophelia. Now sure, they were both crazy murderous cultists, but it does suggest that he had a real affection for somebody, that he cared for another human being. Each of the Chosen besides Caleb is taken away by one of Chernabog's three arch-demons. The one who kidnaps Ophelia, the one you fight at the end of the first episode, is Chiok, the Grey Gargoyle. And when you arrive at his altar, you find this. Ophelia? No! Show yourself! Show yourself! This moment is really off-putting the first time. The whole episode, you've been this raving psychopath, gleefully slaying waves of cultists and monsters, and suddenly, he's in disbelief. Then he cries out, not in his maniacal cackle, but in pain, emotional agony. That agony turns to overwhelming, righteous anger. The ground trembles, and for the first time, he doesn't just make a coy suggestion for his enemies to drop dead. He commands Chiog to appear so he can take revenge. This is it, right here. Not his induction into the cult, not his past deeds, not even his betrayal, death, or rise from the grave. This is the moment Caleb loses the last of his humanity. There are no attachments to his heart anymore. The entire world is just him, Chernabog, and the bodies that lay between them. And when the battle is over, he gives his love one last goodbye. Sleep, Ophelia. Absolutely chilling performance. Whoa! Ooh, just me. I find it interesting that in the middle of this current renaissance of retro styled shooters, Blood is the only game that you can look at and say, like, oh yeah, that inspired this. These other games, they, they take a bit from Doom, a bit from Quake. Uh, maybe like, you know, Ion Fury is some combination of the tones from Duke and Shadow Warrior. But Blood is this consistent, powerful force, so much so that you can immediately recognize its creative legacy. One of the main things that sets it apart is Caleb. It's rare to see a protagonist quite like him uh, in any medium. That character was a shell, essentially, when they started. In fact, he was just going to be some nameless cultist with no real personality, 
and the decision to rework him from the ground up and give him voiced lines happened rather late in development. And still, Stefan Waite was able to breathe life into that person. Ironically, because he's, you know, he's dead. He is a master of voice acting, and any project that has him on is truly lucky. Uh, if you're curious about him, he's making an appearance in the upcoming documentary First Person Shooter, uh, which will also feature this smorgasbord of uh, other huge names from the FPS genre's history. Uh, his website will also be linked down below. And if I could be so bold, I'd, li I'd like to thank him for being such a huge part of one of my favorite games of all time. Uh, check out Blood on Steam, Space War Olympics 2 at 1000 subs. Uh, bye.